record. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Don Weinstein from ADP, and uh, here to share with you an, hopefully an interesting story about an acquisition that uh, we did uh, earlier at the very beginning of this year of a company called uh, Work Market. And I think I, I saw Anand's open, and he ripped through his slides at an average pace of about 30 seconds per. So I will try and hold court on that, uh, but do the best I can. Um, so that's exactly it. How did we enter in this new market? And, and what Work Market is, is a platform for corporations to engage with and manage freelance or gig workers. You hear a lot about the gig economy out there, but I'm not talking about you know, Uber or Lyft or some of those other more uh, kind of consumer-oriented platforms. This is a recognition of a lot of enterprises also use contractors and freelancers and actually are growing and how a company like ADP for those of you who don't know us well, we provide payroll and other human capital management services to our clients. How could we uh, participate in that market and help our clients better manage, uh, source, staff, and pay their gig workers? A um, little bit about ADP. As I mentioned, we're about a $13 billion a year uh, company, 57,000 employees. We're in 150 countries uh, around the world. Uh, at the time, I was chief strategy officer and the group of strategy and, and, and corporate strategy and corporate M&A was, was really about a 10-person group here. Uh, that's me. Um, here's what we did. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll go quickly through this so we can get to the meat of it. Um, so we had this idea, and I think this is the, the point that, that Anand liked when I told him the story, and he, he thought folks might or might not find it interesting. You know, we have a, a corporate accelerator. Right? We call it our ADP Ventures Group, but it's not external VC investing. It's kind of like our own internal uh, next generation growth investing. And you know, we go through the typical ideation processes. And we had this concept that had been kicking around the company for a while. We called it the universal work record. And the idea behind it is you know, companies or a lot of individuals, you have profiles about yourself out there in the world think of like LinkedIn, you know, the major problem that you have with these is they're completely unverified. Uh, my favorite example is on LinkedIn, my dentist endorsed me for strategic planning. So thank you very much, Dr. Knapp, uh, but I'm not sure what you take out of that. So the idea was a company like ADP, you know, we've got 700,000 clients, we've got, we touch about 50 million workers around the world. What if we could create uh, a, a platform or a universal work record that would have the advantage of being you know, valid, confirmed, validated, all that good stuff. So we got into it, and uh, what we found initially, what, this was basically an idea that was chasing, you know, a, a, that had lacked a, mark, a real market problem fit. So we spent a lot of time kind of pursuing this notion, and we found out people really didn't care. They really didn't have this idea of saying, hey, ADP, we could give you a validated universal work record. And I'm like, eh, so what? You know, why would I do that? There was no business model around it. We spent a lot of time on discovery, though, and we talked to a ton of consumers out there in the world. And what we did find is that while most people really didn't care about you know, having a, a verifiable work record, there was really one group of people who actually do care, and those are job switchers. Right? That's when you actually care, you want to be found. I mean, there's all the metrics out there that once you update your LinkedIn profile, it's because you're in the market. Um, so we, we talked to that group. And then within that, there was sort of a subset, because the average individual really only changes their jobs maybe once every five or 10 years. So it was hard to build a business model around that for us exactly. But there was one group of people who changed jobs much more frequently. And they were, of course, gig workers. Right. And so now what we did is we did our first pivot, which was to say, hey, we want to build this solution. And it was a solution you know, chasing a, a market that didn't exist to, in the process of discovery, identifying an actual real problem for this group of folks called gig workers. So now we said, hey, this is interesting. We talked to a lot of our corporate customers. They're using more and more freelancers to get work done. We talked to a lot of freelancers. They have a lot of challenges that we could help with. So our second pivot was, let's go and build a, a service around freelance workers. And so we built a solution. We called it, uh, uh, it was a, a worker app, W-R-K-R, because I think it, to be really cool in techie, you have to lose vowels. Apparently, vowels are not very cool anymore. So we called it worker. And um, it was conceptually successful in that we got it into the hands of a, of a number 
We did set hard metrics. That was one of the things that Anand talked about. We did set hard metrics. I said, I want to get 1,000 users on it, and we want to be able to track everything. And the users, they liked it. They used it. They enjoyed it. But we had two problems with it. One, the customer acquisition cost was too high. This was a direct-to-consumer, B2C kind of marketing play. And it was really like our, our acquisition costs were high. And then the monetization, because it was a free app and then with buy-up services, so the business model, the monetization wasn't working. We were upside down on the e economics. So then the next pivot was, all right, well, let's go focus on what we do well and what we can bring to the party. Because we knew us going out and acquiring consumer users one by one by one was expensive and we had no expertise in it. But we had this huge group of corporate customers out there who were using freelancers and gig workers and it's completely the wild, wild west. I, I would presume everybody else in the audience here who's on the corporate side would get that. So we said, instead of doing a B2C play, we'll do a B2B platform play. And then our, our next and final and last shift was from, instead of trying to build it, we would go ahead out and buy. And that's what took us to the notion of, let's go into the market, let us understand who's doing it, and do an acquisition play. A Couple lessons learned along the way. One is, I would say, while our initial forays were not super successful on the build side, they made us a much, much smarter acquirer. Because rather than having kind of PowerPointed and studied the market, we had built an app, we had engaged with consumers, we had seen their actual user behavior, we understood what didn't work, and we had a much tighter lens of what we were trying to solve as when we went out into the market to buy. So I think having started down that path made us a much smarter acquirer. The second thing was just kind of interesting as I was sitting in and, and listening to Anand's opening is uh, uh, he had that you know, funny clips from Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures. Well, guess who the lead VC on work market was? Fred Wilson and uh, Union Square Ventures. We had an internal debate about, OK, so we like this market. We think we need to get at it with more scale. Should we buy? We knew we didn't want to build. Partner, not exciting. But we actually had a, a very deep debate about should we just go and do an acquisition or should we make a minority VC-style investment? They were in the process of doing a capital raise. Great to see what Fred thinks about corporates making minority investments. But uh, we actually had the same kind of thought process. For us, we thought this market was incredibly strategic. It's big, you know, depending on whose forecasts you read. It's 30 to 40 million people just in the US, and it is truly a global problem. It's growing. Our market data and our own instincts told us that it was growing faster than traditional employment. And we thought there was a market gap and a problem that we could uniquely solve. And so with that being the case, like we were very purposeful about it. What does a minority investment actually buy you? And the most important thing is what doesn't it buy you, which is strategic control to influence the roadmap to focus more on the segments that are interesting to us. So it was a lot of work to uh, talk our own internal executive and team and board off of the minority investment route, but we uh, ultimately went ahead and we completed the deal uh, this past January, so we're coming up on one year. Uh, and just to relate back to one last uh, of the non-slides, the founder is still with us, so we'll be coming up on the one-year mark, hopefully, uh, and we'll pass that critical anniversary. So that's the story of, of ADP, uh, our entry into the gig market through a number of false starts. One was an idea that was chasing a market. Two was a, a, a good market that we didn't have the ability to build on our own. And then a final pivot, which is to go from a, a build to a buy. Um, and so with that, welcome back up to the stage. And we'll take any uh, questions that you might have. Thank you. I got a lot. OK. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> something you said at the very end, which I think is uh, a big topic these days around founders. You bought the company. Give me what was like your first impression when you met the founders. How much did that matter in what you guys were looking for? Yeah, well, it, it mattered a lot uh, to us because, look, for those of you who are in, in kind of strategy or M&A functions and the types of deals that we're talking about here, these are money-losing companies. Right? So we're making a, a big investment. This isn't a cash return. So this is all about a strategic vision for the future. So A, we want to know whose vision are we buying into. And B, it's also it says a lot about what kind of team have they assembled underneath them. Because one issue that we talked about is how long does the founder stick around. Mm -hmm. 
The other issue is, well, how long does the rest of the team underneath stick around? Because you know, when you're paying a lot of money, a big premium for a future kind of payoff, you want to make sure you've got the right team involved in, in for the long haul. So it was about, hey, do we buy into the founder's vision, but do we buy into the culture that they've created and the type of talent that they have attracted? And was there a vision match? Did you feel the need to make sure that they bought into your vision for the company? Because you just talked about you know, strategic yeah. control allows you to kind of direct the roadmap a little bit. Well, that's exactly it. And I think um, we found we had a shared common vision of the future. We were coming at it from literally opposite ends. So we're in the traditional, what we call the, the, the W-2 employment, right? People who have a regular job for a regular company get paid on a regular cycle. We were moving saying, hey, let's think about how does this labor economy evolve? If we wanna be a total talent provider, we have to get into the gig space. They're on the opposite side. They're sitting here saying, hey, we're in the gig space, but our client, the ultimate customer here, because we're in a kind of a B2B play, is has both traditional labor and uh, freelancer uh, type labor. And so we were kind of aiming at the same future with completely opposite starting points, but a kind of a shared vision. And that, that was actually, to be clear, that was critical for the founder feeling comfortable coming on board and, and, and selling the company to For it. sure. Yeah. Well, so the, uh, how you got there is an interesting notion because your, your starting point was very much kind of in line with the existing ADP business exactly. of employment, uh, you know, kind of tracking security. That's right. Um, your endpoint is something that is arguably pretty disruptive to what uh, ADP's core kind of business is doing. Talk to me about the internal dynamics of that. Were there people you had to convince? Are there people who are still maybe on the fence about whether this is a, a good thing going forward? Um, for sure, it is, a, it is a bit of a demarcation. Um, there were people we had to convince. We used the combination of, we like to call it the, the greed and the fear balance factor. And uh, one of the ways we got people over the hump was actually on a little bit on the fear side of things. Because what we found is, look, our business, the way we, we, we work is we provide services to companies. Our pricing model is simple. It's on a per employee basis. You know, X dollars per service times number of employees. Well, if you, if you see the forecast and the actual data, the number of people who are employed by companies has been steadily declining. Right? and the number of freelancers are growing. So our core business model, it's, it's not under attack by the freelance economy, I would call it more of a slow erosion. Mm -hmm. And so we put that out in front of the, the folks to make sure they understand this isn't an option for us, right? Well, we can choose the option or not. It's like our core business is slowly being eroded. It doesn't go to zero, but if we wanna grow, we can't sit still. Sure. And then so you guys started building something yourselves. I wanted to delve into that a little bit more. Talk to me about what that was like as a big company trying to build something that was, you know, again, you know, kind of yeah. different from what ADP is. Um, and what were the lessons there that then informed the acquisition? That's right. So we set up a completely separate team. You know, the, the, the other lesson learned, I'm sure a lot of you have learned this as well, but to get something like that's different like that done, you can't push it through the mainstream of the organization. We had a very small team. We had three full-time people, and then we supplemented them with some contractors as well, ironically enough, as we were building an app for contractors, sequestered from the rest of the business. And I would rather have two or three people 100% dedicated than 50% of 100 people's time. So had to have them completely separate, separate brand, everything off to the side. Actually, the brand was an interesting conversation where the company was worried about us using the ADP brand, which stands for stability and everything working perfectly well, uh, which you would care about when it comes to things like getting paid, and saying, hey, if you're going to do this experimental stuff, we would actually feel more comfortable if you don't use the company's yeah. brand. How do you handle the internal dynamics of, of, the, of just the people there, though? Yeah. Um, I think we've all been part of organizations where when somebody gets put off on the side and gets a special name, starts becoming a little bit of tension, uh, even amongst employees, amongst the executives. Uh, you know, what do you guys do to try to manage uh, the egos? Yeah. Well, first of all, one of the, the key principles I have on any type of, of internal venture like this is we always have to have another co-sponsor who's on the executive team. And I use that as a rule of thumb for two reasons. One is it's uh, for, for kind of having, it's not all on my shoulders to be the one who's only defending this, to have some partners in crime, number one. Number two, it's actually just a litmus test of how interesting the idea is. If, if we have 13 people on our executive committee, if you can't get one out of 13 people to get excited about your idea, then maybe it's not 
ready for prime time yet. But that was certainly, that's a key linchpin for us, is making sure that we have, in some cases, in this case, we actually had two members of the executive committee, in addition to myself, so that's three, sign on as being executive sponsors because they were so excited about the idea, and that provides more of a foundation of support. And so it, it sounds like it's not necessarily consensus building. You don't, you're not trying to convince the entire organization this is the right way to go. Not at the initial stage level, right? If, it, you'll never innovate if you're trying to get to consensus. The hard part for us isn't starting things. We can start a million things. It's how do you get to say, well, which of these are going to scale? That's where the consensus building comes more into play because typically it's going to have, again, with just three people off in the side, separate brand, all right, you guys go do your thing, you're not scaring that many people. Sure. It's when it starts to become meaningful and big and it's going to have a big impact on the core business, it's going to touch other people's, you know, my clients and you want to sell your app to my clients, maybe you're going to start leveraging the brand, it becomes a little bit more threatening. That's the point where um, having actually started it and incubated it and having a real business or a real product that's actually working with real market data and client feedback is our anchor point. Because if it's just me showing up with my PowerPoint on why this idea is great and we should go do it, that becomes much harder versus this notion of, well, let's just go incubate it, try it, build it. You know, I'm thinking of the, I really like the Nan's presentation, the same thing. We don't want to be the donkey stuck in the middle. We're just going to go do something and then if we have it, we'll come back. So once we create that sort of safe space to incubate, that's easy. We need to generate enough data and enough market evidence to then use the facts and the information to overcome. Yeah, and is it difficult? Because you, know, you talked about it's a slow erosion. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, slow erosion can also mean a long time until you're making any serious, serious cash. You guys are a very big company. Mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that this project is probably has a pretty long time horizon. Mm -hmm. it, did that take convincing to say like, look, I know that we're going to be plowing resources and time and people and, and, yeah. and you know, just you know, thought into uh, this thing and then we're going to have to go through an acquisition process, like all the whole thing for something that's going to pay off 20 years down the road <laughs> or so. Like, I, talk to me about like, what, yeah, what's that conversation like for you guys? Well, it's never an easy conversation uh, with, with the executive committee or the board to talk about money losing acquisitions, right? That you want to pay a premium for that now I have to depreciate through the P&L. Um, you know, fortunately for us, and so the way we had to approach it is that at the time I had the entire M&A portfolio. So the conversation then, it can't be just, hey, my entire portfolio can consist of things that are drains on the corporation's cash. So we had, uh, fortunately, a couple of bigger, you know, more in the wheelhouse cash positive. And so that gave us a good foundation to say, now we're generating enough cash out of our portfolio, we can go reinvest it in some of these. But it's definitely a balance. And I've had this conversation with my CEO multiple times. Uh, he, he described, uh, whenever I use the term strategic, uh, that's a euphemism for, uh, for money losing. So again, as long as we have a, a balanced portfolio of things that are kind of short-term payoff, with you know, generating some cash, it gives us the license and the capacity to go out and try some of these other things. Sure. So when you guys um, made the decision to acquire, had you guys already been looking at these companies or was it kind of like a realization that like, look, I don't know that we're gonna be able to build this thing, we need to start getting out in the market. And then about how many companies did you look at? Like how many are out there doing this kind of thing? There, there were a lot. That was probably one of the first things. That as soon as we step, you know how it is, as soon as you like start paying attention to something, then the signs are, are everywhere. So as soon as we started paying attention to it, we're like, wow, there are a lot of companies that have, that have been out this. Part of what, what convinced me, like for instance, Work Market had actually been incorporated in 2010. Mm -hmm. You know, people weren't talking about, everybody's talking about the gig economy now. Nobody was talking about the gig economy back in, in 2010. So, you know, again, the original founder, true visionary, you know, saw what was happening in the world. And they were already on the third iteration of their platform. And so that was part of the thought process because one of the biggest pushbacks we got was for the amount of dilution that we were taking. Why don't you just go build that? Yeah, but we'd be starting from scratch. We have no IP. They've got an eight-year lead in the market. They're on the third version of their platform. So that was one of the, the key considerations. But yeah, we did a, we did a pretty robust uh, market scan out there. What was interesting is a lot of these companies are very immature. And one of the areas where they were the most immature 
was not understanding what it actually takes to sell into a corporate buyer, right? Because they're just, hey, I'll start an app and it's great and people, everybody's gonna use it and love it and I've got five people at you know, XYZ company so you know, I can put their logo on my slide, but you haven't really cracked the code there. Mm. So that was one of the things that really impressed us the most about work market was the sophistication that they had put into you know, selling into the enterprise market. And not to say that that's the only way to succeed in this market, but that was our core thesis of, well, why should we play in this market? Who are we? What right? What brand permission do we have? And we knew that all of that existed through the enterprise. So as we went out and kind of kicked the tires, the fact that they had been so advanced on that one, we zeroed it in on them uh, pretty quickly. Then the next hard part was they weren't for sale. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah, come on, everybody's for sale. <laughs> everybody's, well, everybody's for sale, but yes. Uh, but they weren't actively in a process, which is where we prefer to like to be, right? Not, you know, hey, you got the term sheet, now I'm going to bake off and let the highest bidder win, but more to be in a one-to-one a -one direct negotiation. But that actually, you know, ends up taking a little bit more time. For sure. And then, all right, so you, you buy them. You're, you're psyched to have them here. Yes. But you know, we've seen these kinds of acquisitions and integrations go wrong plenty of time. Times. Um, talk to me about it. Did you guys build a roadmap? Uh, you know, what had you learned ahead of time, and how has that gone since? Like trying to say, like, all right, we've got this new part of the company. It's still like, you know, kind of sequestered off. It still has its own founder who's yes. kind of running it, but it is part of ADP now. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, what's our whole approach? This is one of the toughest challenges we have. Of okay, you want to go and do something kind of uh, a little different. You want to go find an innovative company. How do you retain that which you thought made them special in the first place, and yet at the same time, you know, the business case the synergies have to be created. If I just leave them out there, what was the point of, of buying them either? So uh, where we focused in on, certainly we, we did all the back office type stuff. You know, that's like a no-brainer that nobody's really bothered by that. Um, Roadmap was critical. You know, we had a thesis for where the right points of intersection would be. Um, I think that's been going a little bit slower in part because as a smaller company, they had made certain commitments to their, you know, big landmark customers. And so that, you know, drained uh, capacity. And then what we've just done is like slowly over time, we're about a year into it, we just start introducing some kind of core ADP talent who we've pre-vet and think would be a good fit in that organization. And slowly we've been introducing them in critical roles. But it wasn't like a, hey, we're in charge around here. Like the person, for instance, who led the, the, uh, the innovation, the venture, when we were first starting to do the build, who then turned and led the acquisition scan and the diligence and all of that. We kind of introduced him into the organization. His first role was um, you know, post-merger integration manager. Now he's effectively COO running the whole place and, and mm. like 80% of the people report into him, but that wasn't an overnight. That was kind of when it became so obvious and natural, we just sort of made it happen. So it was kind of slow, gradual, picking our spots is how I would describe it. Yeah. But, but you can't ignore it, otherwise. Yeah, no, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Right. Um, I've got some great questions here from, from audience members I wanted to, to throw in. Uh, one is, um, you know, name another large company that you guys look to that's pursuing kind of innovation growth in, in a similar way. Uh, you know, who do you view as role models and why? Yeah, the, the one that I, and in, in, in my new role, I've moved from the strategy organization back into the technology organization. You know, the company I admire a lot uh, is Salesforce um, because I think they have that, that kind of three-part play down. And that is how we think about innovation. We do, we do buy, as I've talked about. We do build. And, and we also partner. I didn't really mention a lot, but we have a, 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 an ADP marketplace, which we've honestly modeled a lot on the Salesforce app exchange. And we use that as a way, like I don't have to invest in VCs to get a pulse on the market. We've got a lot of clients. People want to tap into our client base and they want to integrate with us. We put it out there in our marketplace and then we're able to see uh, what's getting traction with our customer base. And some of the, some of the, the, to me the biggest learning there is some of the most successful partners in our marketplace and our app store are companies I've never heard of mm. and we never would have thought to partner with but the clients clearly like their value proposition, that's helping to fill 
uh, our M&A pipeline. We got, a, we got a whole half hour on uh, partnership. Sorry, I won't go. I'll no, go no, no worries. Um, what I wanted to get to as well um, was that CB Insights shared some data earlier today that uh, more than a third of founders, oh, no, I'm reading the wrong question, excuse me. Organizations have a natural preference to build in-house. We talked about a little bit of this earlier. Um, after the work market acquisition, are you having better success now spotting other acquisitions uh, earlier before you start the build? And what are some of the key criteria that you uh, let you know that an acquisition is necessary? Yeah, no, th that's a really great question. It's probably the toughest part of my job is that whole, hey, build, partner, buy aspect. We've got some models for it, how we think about it. Um, they're not perfect. It's all about the um, same thing. It's like a process. So the process is the process because you need to have one. It's the quality of the thinking uh, that goes into it. What I did find, though, is after we did the work market acquisition, uh, our phone started ringing a lot more. And sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes that can be a bad thing because it's just chewing up lots of time with people who are looking to unload companies in there their portfolio. It definitely got our name out there um, a little bit more. Um, it definitely increased our internal appetite. So it's sort of like a, a muscle. You have to exercise it from now and, and again, uh, or else it atrophies. I would say we still probably have more of an internal, the culture of the company, still more of a bias towards build, but I would say at least an openness uh, to buy. Sure. All right, I get, uh, I get four minutes left. We've got overrated, underrated for okay. you. So we got four of them. You get about a minute each. Overrated or underrated and why? First one I have here is activist shareholders. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, overrated. Um, I don't know, for those of you who, who may or may not know, we, had a, uh, we still have the, an activist sh uh, shareholder in our stock. Uh, what was funny was uh, he put together a presentation that he published publicly about all these great growth ideas that we should be pursuing. Ironically, we were already doing all of them. In fact, one of them, uh, it was in this area for us to kind of monetize our data because we have a lot of insights about what's happening in the economy. And we actually had gone and called on his firm to pitch them to be a customer of it. And then his presentation put, oh, we have this great idea. Here's what they should be doing that they're not. So. Uh, you Highly them, oh, overrated. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, next one is um, blockchain. Um, I would say overrated. Uh, we are trying to do a few things right now. Um, as I said, we, we pay uh, about 50 million people uh, throughout the year. Um, the question comes up, like, do people want to get paid in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency? Right now, we have, exact, have 700,000 clients. We have exactly <laughs> one out of the 700,000 companies that wants to be paid in Bitcoin, it is a cryptocurrency company that wants to pay their employees in their own uh, currency. Makes sense. Fair enough. Um, I think I know the answer to this one, but the gig economy. I think the gig economy is under, uh, what was it, overrated, underrated? Yeah. Or, I think it's underappreciated um, because what most people are thinking about right now when I talk to them, I say gig economy, they think Uber, Lyft, TaskRabbit, right? That's all good. That's growth. The part that's underappreciated and underrated is how much is present in corporations. Every single company I talk to, and I talk to a lot of clients, part of my job, obviously, and I'm sure for you guys as well, and I always ask them the same three questions. Do you use gig workers? How many do you have? And who's responsible for them? And the answers are always, yes, we use them. I have no idea how many we have, and it's the Wild West out there. So I think this is gonna be a, the next great trend. As, as in most companies I talk to, actually, because normally in, we do human capital management services, our prime contact is the HR department. In most companies, gig workers are the domain of the procurement department. And that is an enormous, enormous miss if you think about your employment value proposition and your ability to build your company and your employment brand into the gig economy and running them through procurement. Well, let me just ask you a follow-up question there then. I mean, is that even a gig economy thing or is that just temporary workers and is there a line anymore? Is I, it just the notion that like Uber and Lyft have made something that was probably relatively common, now even more common and, and maybe more accessible for people? Yeah, so two things there. One is. Our whole thesis is the line is blurring, yeah. right? That's why, because otherwise you'd say, why do you want to get into that market? If the lines are separate, there's no rationale for us to be there. We think the, the lines are blurring, but likewise, work market, who was on the other side, saw the blurring. The other thing I would say is, this has actually been going on for way longer than, than Uber and Lyft. I mean, in your field of journalism, mm. most journalists 
are uh, freelancers or gig workers. Uh, you go into a typical hospital and they're pulling together people like on a surgical team and it's dynamic and the surge, I, it, it's a comforting thought, anybody who's ever gone to surgery and the surgeons are introducing themselves <laughs> Have you had this experience where they're saying, yes, uh, hi, nice to meet you. Who are you? What do you do? And then, you know, they'll pick a, a nurse up who has the full-time gig at the hospital and then is doing a night kind of freelance. This has been going on in the economy forever, right? I think what's now is it's coming out of the underground. It's being realized. And just like anything else, you see it's working in the consumer economy. So it's lighting a match under the enterprise space. Excellent. All right, last one because we're out of time. Corporate venture capital, overrated, underrated? Uh, I would say overrated. We, we, don't really, we, we don't really have a corporate venture capital fund. We have made a handful of, of corporate venture investments only when there's a strategic purpose. If we're doing a, a strategic partnership with a smaller company and we feel in that case, in cases we don't want to own for a variety of reasons, it doesn't make sense for us to own, it does make sense for us to partner. And through partnering, we have the opportunity to create a lot of value as a big company for a smaller company. We want to participate in that value creation. So we'll make a small investment in exchange for some equity. But honestly, the, typically in those scenarios, they're valuing the partnership with a company like ADP much more than you know, the couple of million bucks that we're throwing at them that they could go raise on the street. Perfect segue, because Thomas Kinker from Deutsche Telekom is coming out right now to talk partnerships. Don, thank you so much. Thank you.